Well, I hope you're having a great day and I'm very thankful that you're joining me again for today's teaching from God's Word, for today's message. We started a brand new series last week as we are entering the new year 2021 and we're calling this series, Now What? And actually we're going through the last book of the Bible. Uh, the Bible has 66 units, uh, 39 in the old, 27 in the new, and the last book is called Revelation. And it's not Revelations, it's actually Revelation because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now we know this book, or most people know this book, uh, as a book of seven seals and seven trumpets and seven vials or seven bowls. Um, and it has 22 chapters. But really, the main character of the book is Jesus Christ. And last week we saw that in chapter 1. And we actually saw four notable characteristics uh, of the book of Revelation. Let me repeat them really quick. Number one, this book, Revelation, tells us about the future. It tells the future. Number two, it promises a blessing. A blessing for everybody? Not really. A blessing for all who hear it and who do it or live by it. Number three is, I think, I really believe this, the most important point. It is this book portrays a person and his name is Jesus. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And number four, this book generates a response. Now, I think those four characteristics are very important for the study of the book of Revelation, but uh, these four points are also true for the Bible as a whole, because the Bible tells about the future. More than a quarter of the Bible is prophetic in nature. Actually, uh, like 26% of it tells us about the future. Hundreds of prophecies have already come to pass, and the rest will come to pass in time. And it is true that the whole Bible is a book about the future, the past, the present, and the future. The whole Bible promises a blessing for those who, who read it and hear it and do it. Jesus said, uh, blessed is the man uh, who builds his house uh, upon the rock. He hears my words and he does my words. And no matter what rains come, what floods come, what storms come, the house will stand because it's built upon the rock. And this book, the whole Bible portrays one person. Uh, it's Jesus. The whole Bible is the story from the beginning of creation, the Word of God. The Word was made flesh and the Word, Jesus, will come again. We see that in Revelation chapter 19. And this book generates a response. We have to make a decision when we hear the Word of God. There is not no decision. See, when I asked my wife, or when I did ask my wife uh, over 30 years ago, would you marry me? Now, the answer to that question is either or. There is no maybe. A maybe would be a no because maybe does not mean yes. So there's always a decision. Even when we think we're not making a decision, we're actually making one. When we decide to watch evil and do nothing about it, we're making a decision. So it's generating a response. So chapter 1 in the book of Revelation, of all the 22 chapters that are incredible, and we'll look at most of them, we'll look at the, the most important themes of the book, um, is all about Jesus. Chapter 1 is a, a grandiose vision that the Apostle John had of the glorious resurrected Jesus Christ. Now, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, like I mentioned. In the Greek, it's apocalypsis, which actually we have our word apocalypse from, as you could guess, apocalypsis, and it means actually uncovering 
or taking the cover away. It means disclosing something. And that's what we have with Jesus and many other things. We get the truth. So it's the truth is being uncovered. So apocalypse does not mean the world is going to pot. So it, it does not mean the end of the world like most people think when they hear, hear the word apocalypse. They think about, you know, the end of the world. I mean, it will get rough. We, we read that also, that it will get rough and when, when Jesus comes back or until Jesus comes back, two things will happen. We know that for a fact. Number one, uh, evil will get worse or the darkness will get worse. And number two, the light will get lighter. So we shine brighter and then Jesus comes back. So until Jesus comes back, it will get darker but as believers, true believers, will light or shine brighter. So apocalypse, apocalypsis, is an uncovering. And John has an overwhelmingly awesome vision of Jesus Christ in chapter 1. Now, I think I mentioned this last time. If we don't understand chapter 1 and that it's about Jesus and him, being the ultimate victor of a death, hell, and the grave. If we don't get that right from the beginning, we will make mistakes all the way along through the whole book of Revelation. Because it's not the revelation of the Antichrist or the number 666 or the beast or any of that, or the tribulation even. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think I said that enough now, but we have an incredible promise in 1 John Chapter 3, verse 2, the apostle writes, the same guy who wrote the book of Revelation, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, when he comes, we shall be like him. He's talking to believers, to Jesus followers. For we shall see him as he is. We will see him. We'll have the same picture, the same image that John had as he was at the Isle of Patmos and he had that vision as he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. We will have the same thing happening to us. We will see Jesus as he is and we will be changed forever. So chapter 1 is about Jesus. Now, today we're going to chapter 2 and 3, and I'm actually going to show you some footage in a little bit about two cities where I've been to recently. We're going to not look at all seven of the letters. Uh, there are seven letters to seven churches in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation. So Jesus has words to seven churches in Asia. Now, Asia has nothing to do with Asia today, like Japan or Thailand or India or th like that. It was actually the province of Asia in modern Western Turkey. Okay, And the island of Patmos, and I'll show you a map real quick, the island of Patmos was about 30 miles off the shore, or 50 kilometers off the shore, a Greek island off of the shore of Greece. And from there, he had that vision of Jesus, and Jesus instructed him to write to seven churches in the area of the province of Asia. It was a circular letter uh, that uh, John wrote there, and it was... Uh, you know, for, for all the Christians there in these churches. Now, seven is the number of fulfillment. So I would say that these letters were not only applicable to those seven churches, but to all the churches uh, that were around back then and also today for you and for me. Now, let's read uh, in chapter one one more time before we then go to chapter two and then to chapter three. In chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, and then 19 and 20, it says, For the Lord's day, on the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and heard, I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it 
to the seven churches. Now here they are. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Write, therefore, they, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, I said to you earlier that I believe with all my heart, and that's what Revelation tells us, as we come closer to the end, or let's say come closer to to the coming of Christ, which is actually His second coming, which is actually our true beginning in all eternity. We will rule with Him. We'll have a new heaven, a new earth. See, that's what we have to know. It's not so important what all takes place up to that point. Important is that you are ready, hence my title for today, How Ready Are You? And uh, you know, don't be so infatuated with all the details of all the seals and trumpets and bowls and all the, the you know, tribulation and the beast and the Antichrist. We can talk about all that and we will, but are you ready? Do you see Jesus, chapter 1? And the question to the churches, and that's what the central messages are to those churches, get ready. How ready are you? You know? He corrects them and he commends them. He has something good to say about most of them and he has something to correct in most of them. So I picked two churches for us today, which is Ephesus, the first one, and Laodicea, the seventh one. And those are, I think, for us today, very important. For modern Christianity, very important. I'll explain that later. But what I was going to say is this. He says, the seven stars and the seven lampstand. Well, to simplify it, I won't go into all the details right now because I can't, I don't have the time. But to simplify it is, we are the lampstands as Christians and I also believe that we are the stars. You know, it says here the angels of the churches. Some say the leaders of the churches, or the messengers of the churches. The Greek word is angelos, which means messenger. But, you know, I think it's true followers of Christ who are the stars shining in this world and who are the lampstands. Uh, those are the churches. So we shine, we are stars, and we are lampstands for Jesus Christ. So, let's get going with the two churches that we're going to talk about today. And don't forget this. All of what I'm saying today is, do you see Jesus, chapter 1? And are you ready? Like Jesus spoke to the churches, chapter 2 and 3. And then in, verse, in chapter 4, we see a vision of heaven. Chapter 5, we see the Lamb of God who was slain for our sins and the sins of the whole world. And then we go into some uh, tribulation stuff and, you know, some Babylon stuff, some beast stuff, some 666 stuff, and some white horse, red horse, um, pale horse, black horse stuff, all this kind of stuff. But we must be ready. I'm, I really am scared for some of these end time experts, whether the ones preaching it, there's some good ones, but there's also some some, uh, you know, not so good stuff out there, but I'm really scared about the, the people that are so infatuated with end time stuff. Uh, they want to know everything and they think they know a lot. And, but the main question is, are you ready? Are you ready? I mean, I don't know everything about the Antichrist and I don't know everything about the beast or 666 or Babylon or whatever, but I want to see Jesus and I want to be ready. And I know I'm on the winning side. So that's the most important stuff that we have to know. Do we know Jesus and are we ready? Are we ready to shine bright so the lampstand will stand and will not be removed? Our impact will not be removed and our light will shine strong in this world. Now let's go to Ephesus. And I'll show you some footage as well as I read this, but uh, let's go there. Because I've been there recently, and I can tell you one thing. There is a real Ephesus. There were real 
Christians there, real Jesus followers with real persecution who stood firm for the faith of Christ. Let's read. Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7. This is the first church Jesus writes to. It's also the biggest city uh, of the seven and the most prominent one. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. He's amongst us. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tasted those Tasted. You have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That's an awesome letter. And in, in, in verse 2 and 3 and verse 6, we have praise for these people, for this church. And in verse 4 and 5, we have a rebuke. Now, we don't like rebuke. You don't, I don't, my kids don't. <laughs> Nobody really likes to be rebuked or corrected or disciplined. But check this out. In Hebrews 12, verse 6, it says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and chastises every son whom he receives. Now, that's good news. He loves us, and that's why he corrects us. Now, that's so, so contrary to the spirit of today's world, where it like goes like, well, if it makes you happy, then do it. Or, no, let everybody do what they want to do. Well, I, I don't agree. I think if you love someone, you help them find the right path. You correct if it's your children uh, or even a good friend. You, you bring a loving rebuke because of love. It's very important. The Lord disciplines those he loves. Now, this letter is the first one. It's very important. We know there's also the book, the letter to the Ephesians by Paul the Apostle, which he wrote, uh, you know, Pretty, pretty near to his death, or in, at least from prison, we know that. Ephesus was a port city. It was spectacular. It was an intellectual center with a, with a fantastic, huge library. It was also full of emperor worship, an imperial cult, uh, and rampant sexual immorality, and worship of deities, the most famous Artemis. I'll get that in a moment. And it also had uh, an incredible market called the Agora, where trading and spying and selling took place. It was very rich. It was affluent. It was a world city. Probably much like today, London, Paris, or Shanghai or Tokyo. It was a world city. But it was difficult for Christians because of the emperor worship and the worship of false god. But the emperor worship was a real problem. You have to understand, when you entered the Agora, there was an incense burner. And the, the people had to take a little incense as they went into the market to do so on good terms, in good standing, and throw some incense on the incense burner as a sign of allegiance and worship to the emperor. Um, great challenge for Christians, as you can imagine, because what if they close down my shop? If I don't do that, what if I lose out? These were real threats for Christians. And there were pagan gods and goddesses everywhere. Fourteen temples that was, was there. And the greatest of them, the most famous of them, which was also one of the seven wonders of the world, 
I think it was destroyed somewhere in the 3rd century, was the temple to the goddess of Artemis or Diana. It was like one and a half football fields long and more than a football field wide. And it had 127 pillars of marble. It was gigantic. Everyone came to worship there to worship this goddess of fertility. Every aspect of life, the banking center, uh, every aspect of life was involved with that temple. Banking center, a central point of the city, also uh, sexual, um, you know, um, sexual stuff, occult stuff, over 100 or hundreds of temple prostitutes, female and male. Now we read about this temple also in Acts chapter 19 because the silversmiths of the city of Ephesus made money and lots of it by selling, uh, you know, little statues and things uh, with the image of Artemis, this goddess. And it was a big problem for Christians. And uh, Paul almost got killed there. And, uh, you know, and it was a, a bad thing for Christians. Now, there was also the worship of Domitian. His temple was the highest. As, as you came by ship into the city, you could take the river all the way to the, the city. You saw on the highest point the temple of Domitian and his statute. And he demanded worship. That was a big, big problem for Christians. And Domitian persecuted followers of Jesus the hardest of all. It was difficult to stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, like Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 6 verse 10 in his letter to the Ephesians. But it was also very occult. A lot of demonic activity all around. Very dark. And Paul wrote about that actually in his mentioned letter. I'll read that to you. Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 14. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Now let's stop here for a second. Before Paul wrote this, obviously this is towards the end of his letter, he says, finally, he wrote to them about all kinds of things, the way Christians should live in the dark world. You know, forgiving, loving, how to, how to live with your wife and your husband, submission one to another, raising children, and even, you know, how to deal with your boss or your employees, etc. So he wrote a lot of things about living the way we should live in the previous chapters of the letter of Ephesus. Also about who we are in Christ and how we have spiritual realities, spiritual realities that nobody can take away from us. And then he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when they, the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. So, Paul wrote to them about standing firm against spiritual wickedness, against spiritual darkness, against spiritual demonic activity. And they knew exactly what he meant. They, he, he wrote to them about something that they knew exactly what he meant. And they took him seriously. They were strong. And there is no compromise, really, uh, in the Ephesian church as it is about faithfulness to Jesus, faithfulness to the only true and living God, even though the pressure was great. Now, Jesus commends them, for example, that they hate 
the deeds, the actions, the life of the Nic Nicolaitans. Well, they were a Christian sect. They tried to combine the occult and sexual practices to deities with Christianity. But they stood firm against that cult, against that false teaching. They stood firm against emperor worship. They were strong. I asked myself, why? How could they stand so firm? Now, I believe it has to do with leadership. Because, for instance, Paul, the apostle, we read that in Acts 19 and 20, he was there for almost three years and he taught in the school of Tyrannus every single day for over two years, from 11 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. <laughs> Paul laid a strong foundation. He proclaimed the word of God. That was very effective. So I think they could stand firm on the word because there was really good leadership and Paul the Apostle invested a lot of his time and leadership into them. We know that. But what does Jesus have against them? Good questions. We read that in actually in chapter 2 and we read it in verse uh, 4. Let me read it to you again. It says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. One translation says you've left your first love. You've left the, mo you've left the most important thing. You're doing good things. You're having great works. But you're not doing them because you love me. It's habit. It's a project. It is duty, but not because you love me. And if you don't change, if you don't turn around, your lampstand will disappear, which actually happened. And you will lose your light and your power. Now, I don't believe that has to do with losing your salvation, because our salvation comes because we have trusted Christ, He has forgiven our sins and our allegiance, our faith is in Him and Him alone. Salvation is by faith, not by works. Also in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. But the lampstand can be gone. The light can disappear. The influence, the power, that's what really happened. So He commends them for their work, for, for hating lies and hating you know, false practices and false teaching. And he commends them for doing good and working hard and enduring. But he reprimands them for losing their first love. What's the lesson from Ephesians, or from the church in Ephesus, as written in Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7? The lesson is Jesus longs for a relationship. Not, be, not behavior, not doing and more doing. He longs for a relationship. Now, sometimes, recently, I actually did the dishes at home. <laughs> this is yeah, a bit surprising for my wife, actually. But I remember recently, I thought, man, I, wanna, I just want to be, I just want to show my wife I love her. And... I, I did the dishes, I did, you know, cleaned up in the kitchen a little bit, did the dishes, loaded the dishwasher, the bigger dishes I washed up, by, off, washed by hands, and she came in and she saw that I did the dishes, and she says, why did you do that? You didn't have to do that. What did I say? Well, I did it because this is my duty, I want to be a good husband, and I want to be, you know, I want to honor the institution of marriage. No, I didn't say that. I said, I love you, honey. And... Isn't it true? If we really love someone who is the most important person in our life, we want to show. We want to look for things, how we can show that we love that person. Well, I do that sometimes, and I should do more of it. Uh, I did it because I love you. And Jesus is looking for that. Jesus is looking for love. And the reward is great. The eternal tree of life. Paradise. See? The people in Ephesus thought that 
Artemis was the goddess of fertility and life. And there was actually a tree there where people came to. But Jesus says, no, no, no. I give you the true tree of life. You can eat from the true tree of life in paradise, in the Eden that's coming. Matthew 5, 12, we see the reward. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. Man, that's an awesome, awesome thought. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Great is your reward in heaven. So what's the lesson of Ephesians? Man, turn around. Go back to your first love. Don't let it be duty or habit. Now, if you're listening to me and you don't know Jesus yet at all, this will probably sound a little foreign to you, but, but you, will, you will understand. When you give your life to Jesus, and I'll give that opportunity to anyone who wants to at the end of this message, if you give your life to Jesus, you'll understand true love and how awesome it is when you feel cleansed from your sins and you know that Jesus covered all your sins and he did it because he loves you and he died on the cross because he, he loves you. He died for your sins and mine because he loves us. And then you know what love is, but never let go of that love. See, religion is works. Religion is just duty. Jesus is not after you being religious. He's after a relationship. And if you're looking for a religion, you're on the wrong YouTube channel or wherever you're watching this. You, you, you don't find that at, at Oasis Church. <laughs> that, that we're, not, we're not after religion. We don't even promote a religion. We, we, we preach Jesus, who is not a religion. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He died for your sins. He's your Savior, your Redeemer, and He longs for relationship. That's Ephesus. Jesus longs for relationship. That's the story of the church in Ephesus. And Christians who lose that first love, well, they become ineffective in their witness, but everyone should see that you're burning for Christ. Now, let me take you to another city, which is Laodicea, which is the seventh church, the seventh letter. Now, Ephesus is the first letter, and then we're going to go over five of them and go to the seventh one, Laodicea. Now, the other five letters are equally important, I'm sure. But I picked those two because I believe they are most relevant to us today in modern Christianity. Now, let's look at Laodicea, and I'll also show you some footage from there so you know that this is a real place, a real church with real Jesus followers. And... Here it is, Revelation 3, 14, To the angel of the church at Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Well, that's Jesus Christ. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. Now, he doesn't really commend them for anything. He reprimands them right from the get-go. You're neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You're gross. You say I'm rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, truly rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. There it is again. We have that in Hebrews 12, 6 and in Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. So be earnest and repent. I love you still. I'm rebuking you because I love you. Repent. Be earnest. Repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now he's still knocking. That means nobody's beyond hope. Jesus knocks even though where he has nothing to commend them for, nothing to praise them for. Now, Laodicea is an interesting story. It was a booming economy placed at the most important trade routes from all around the world. 
They had wares and goods and also people coming from everywhere to shop there. Very rich and a big banking center, big uh, center for textiles. And they had this, this interesting eye salve that was very, very... Um, people were looking for this eye salve that they had. It was some medicine that, that helped a lot of people, evidently. And people came from afar to get that else, I self. Now, even Christians there were affluent and rich. They could shop everywhere. It was comfortable. There was hardly any persecution there. So it was a good place to live, even for Christians. Comfortable, you know, in affluence. Now, if Laodicea would have been a modern city, it would have been a, a Rolls Royce deal, dealership and a big, 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 huge modern shopping center. But, you know, it was rich. But they had one big problem. And the problem they had was the water. They didn't have good water. They had no water. Like I said, they were, they were placed at the, the, tra the trade routes, which was a very big advantage for business. But the water they didn't have. Now, that was Colossae nearby. They got the water directly from, you know, the snowy mountains. It was fresh and, and cool water which was great and they they sold you know bottled water you know, i don't know if they did but today they would probably sell uh, this beautiful mineral water from colossae but uh on the other side of laodicea not far away a few a few miles a few kilometers away was Herapolis with the hot springs so there was cool water in Col colossae and there was hot springs in Herapolis. And Laodicea didn't have any water. They had to bring it in through these pipes. You can still look at those pipes today. And there's sediments uh, that made the water really disgusting. You know, it was not good to drink. It was not good to cook with. Uh, today, if we would make ice cubes out of it, it would, you know, ruin your iced tea. It was not good. And by the time it got to Laodicea, it was tepid. It was lukewarm. So we have the fresh water of Colossae, we have the hot springs of Herapolis, but we have lukewarm, tepid, gross, these sediments, minerals in the water made the water just not taste good at all. What does Jesus say? What's the message? <laughs> He's saying, hey, I wish you were hot or cold. You know, cold here does not symbolize being cold to Jesus. Uh, and Jesus is basically saying, hey, I wish you were either or, because cold is good, good, good cold water is good, and, and hot water is also good. You know, we'd like to drink hot tea and have a cold iced tea, but middle uh, is not so good. But what Jesus says here is, you remind me of your water. You, as people, as Christians, remind me of your water. You make me sick. <laughs> it's a hard rebuke. It's the hardest probably in all the seven letters. You say you're rich. You know, when you're, you're rich, you don't need him really. You don't really need him. I mean, you will eventually, but I know many Christians, they're practical atheists. They don't really need him because they have everything. They think they have everything. Now, affluence or... Riches, prosperity has always been a problem. It's an old problem. For instance, God warned his people before they came into the promised land, you know, that riches are dangerous. I will bless you, but blessings and riches and affluence can take you away from God. Now, do you know the story of Abraham and Isaac? Well, it didn't happen. Uh, you know, Sarah couldn't get pregnant. So Abraham, you know, helped along. Then he had... Uh, he came into a relationship with, with um, uh, Hagar, Sarah's maid, and Is Ishmael was born. But nothing but problems. And then God came true on his, his promise. Isaac was born in their old age. Wonderful. And one day God said to Abraham, Hey, get up, go to the mountain, I will show you, and offer me your only son. Your first, the promised son. Not the first one, but the promised one. The only son would be you and Sarah. And offer him to me as a sacrifice on the mountain I will show you. Now, that's crazy, right? We think that's crazy and we think, God, why are you doing that? Well, 
gods, false gods of the nations back then, they required that you would offer your child to them. God doesn't want that. Yahweh doesn't want that, obviously. But the point is this. Abraham, am I that important to you? Am I that important to you as the false gods are to some people? Am I that important to you? Would you be willing to give your everything to me? Obviously, God had a, had a replacement. There was a ram called in, caught in the thicket. They offered him, which is a fantastic type of Jesus Christ who died for our sins in the same area where Abraham did that. So, God has not, nothing against riches or affluence. But the lesson we learn in Laodicea is what we really need is Jesus. And affluence could be a major obstacle. Doesn't have to be, but it could be. Now, <coughs> I learned how to preach. Well, some people think I still don't know how, but that's a different story. But I, I learned how to preach in prison. I was not an inmate, I was a visitor, and I actually went with my very good friend, Cherry Pogue, who is much older than me, he already went to heaven a few years ago. He was probably in his 50s when he asked me to go with him, late 40s, early 50s. I was a 19-year-old boy. I met him at the gymnasium in, uh, in Oklahoma as I worked out, and he worked out, and he said, hey, you want to go with me to prison and preach? I said, yes. And I went to that prison with him an hour and a half south of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I walked into the chapel as a hundred men were gathering for worship and the word. I got to preach that day. I preached. I remember what I preached. I preached the text from, from Paul where he said in 1 Timothy 1, Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. I'm the worst of all sinners. What I saw there that day is incredible. A man on the piano singing Amazing Grace with a passion I've not seen since. He's been there at that time for 17 years. He probably is still in the prison if he didn't die already. He killed his wife uh, many, many years ago and he met Jesus in that prison. When I went to that prison, I actually thought, I don't know if I fit in, but when I was there, I thought, man, these are my brothers. They love Christ. These are followers of Jesus. Now, we know that persecution actually drives us to Christ. And I know of a missionary in China who said, quit praying that persecution would stop. Pray that we would be strong and faithful. And we see in the major cities of China now, in Beijing and Shanghai and others, where there's churches that they get weaker. The, the more affluent, the more rich it becomes, the weaker the churches tend to get. See, persecution drives us to Jesus. And riches and affluence can be a major obstacle. What we really need is Jesus. Whether we know it or not, affluence could be a major obstacle. Jesus and His Word is everything you need. And Jesus says to them, you know, in uh, the last verses there, He says, um, You say I am rich. You say I have acquired wealth and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize. <laughs> you do not realize. You don't see it. That you are wretched. Pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I mean, doesn't that describe Christians today? I mean, the happiest Christians I've ever met are in jail, who really handed their life over to Christ. The happiest Christians are in jail, or missionaries on the real missionary field in third world countries. Even the children that grow up on the mission field, you know, they are usually have a much greater opportunity or potential to become truly successful because the way they grew up. I watched a video by a footballer, Cristiano Ronaldo, the other day, an interview. And he grew up on the island of Madeira with a father who was the, the, the keeper, the, the, um, the grass keeper of the football club. And the interviewer asked Ronaldo, 
how many cars did your dad have? And <laughs> Cristiano laughed and said, he didn't have a car. He said, how many cars do you have? He said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And he has a son who's also named Cristiano. And he said, how do you deal with him? You know, growing up in that luxury, in those, in that, in those unbelievable riches. He said, well, he actually said some good things. He said, it's difficult. It's very difficult, but I can, I can do it by sh telling him every day, you know, this was all very hard work, and we are very thankful for this. So he really said some really good things. I really liked it. See, affluence can be a danger. Think about your own children. I have six. I want them to be happy and healthy and wealthy. I want them to have everything. But on the other hand, what will that do to our children if they have everything? So I'm very glad I had to buy my first car with my own money. I made my own money at 15. I bought my own moped, my own clothes at 15. I even gave some money at home as I started working as a 15, 16-year-old boy. Didn't understand it at that time, but today I love it and I'm grateful for it. So this is so true. Riches can be a blessing. But riches can also be an obstacle to serving Jesus wholeheartedly. So they thought they were wealthy and rich and had everything. But Jesus says, you don't realize you are not. You're wretched. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're pitiful. You're poor, blind, and naked. He says that to rich people. And see, you're not rich if you don't have Jesus. And you're not rich if you think you're rich in your own eyes. And then Jesus said... Buy from me. Buy from me. Buy from me. I, the gold refined in fire. Spiritual treasure. So you can become truly rich. And white clothes. True, true righteousness. That's a gift from Jesus. So you can cover your nakedness. See, Adam and Eve tried to cover the nakedness with fig leaves. Jesus gives us his robes of righteousness and salve, spiritually speaking, to put on your eyes so you can see. I was blind, but now I see. So we, we have the spiritual gold, the spiritual white clothes of righteousness, the sp spiritual eye salve so we can see. See, all things that they knew much about. They knew about gold. They knew about clothing and textiles. They knew about the eye salve. But Jesus made it spiritual. Only he can give the real. Only Jesus can give the real stuff. The best things come only from Jesus. And then he says, I'm knocking at your door. Open up. See, so he's talking to Christians here. And he's saying, I'm still at the door. I'm still knocking. I'm not giving up on you. Let me in. It's incredible what it says. And then at the very end, it says... I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And a meal, having a meal with somebody was very intimate back then. It was not just, you know, let's have a quick burger. It was a long, intimate thing. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we talked about two, two cities, actually two churches in two cities. Real Jesus followers who lived in a real world and they had problems and they had to conquer them. And I think those two lessons are very key for us today. So the, the most wretched Christians I know are in affluent America and affluent Europe. I'm not saying it's bad to be affluent. I think it's a good thing to be blessed, but I also think it's very important that we are ready to give it up and to give it all to Jesus. Do you have to tithe? Hey, you have to put Jesus number one, and then you think about what you want to give him, because he owns everything. Number one lesson from Ephesus is Jesus is longing for a relationship. He's not longing for obedience without love. He's longing for a relationship, a love relationship, the result will be obedience. And the lesson from Laodicea is, what we really need is Jesus. And affluence could be a major problem.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, good God, thank you for the relevance of your word and the relevance of your letters to these seven churches in Asia Minor back then. They are relevant to us today. God, we don't want to just have rituals and obedience and habits and duty. Though some of that is certainly has its place, but if we lose our love, we have nothing left. We want to love you. We want to love you because you first loved us and we want to love others. Give us a love revival, a true love. And God, help us to see that Jesus is all we need and that affluence could be a major obstacle. God, if affluence, if riches are an obstacle to us, show us, help us to become generous because that's the only way to conquer it and help us to really focus on the real riches, the real, real heavenly gold, heavenly white clothes and heavenly eyes solve so we can see. You only give the real. The best things come only from Jesus. If you've never accepted Jesus, pray this. Jesus, I come to you, a sinner in need of a Savior. You died for me on the cross. You are the Savior of the world. Become my Savior now. I give you my life as good as I can and understand right now. I give you my life and I receive yours. Jesus, I confess you, my Lord, my Savior, my God. I believe that you are raised from the dead in Jesus' name. So, you know, go for the relationship and check your heart. How is your love? And check also your heart. Are you hot? Are you cold? Are you lukewarm? Let's change these things so the world will see the difference. And Jesus is glorified in and through our lives. I love you. And I see you next week.